Hey, welcome to our service tonight. We are very pleased to have each and every one of you. For those of you who haven't been here, we've been studying what we refer to as the history of the church. Sometimes it's hard for us to conceive what the church went through in, in its beginning. Uh, we, we, you know, we're talking, you know, we, we look around us and we see a church on every corner. But in that time, there was only really two uh, major religions, and that was, of course, the Jewish religion. And then you had the Greeks, and they really didn't have a religion. It was more of a, uh, a pagan type of system where they, they had gods. You know, you remember the incident with the Apostle Paul when he stood on Mars Hill? And he looked down over that agora down there, and I was, I've stood there on Mars Hill and looked down there, and they had all of these statues and all of these buildings and so forth that, that gave honor to various gods. And they said in, Greek, in Greece that they had more gods than they had people. That was just, of course, a saying to, to, to illustrate or to emphasize everything they could think of, you know, had a god. And that, that's not only just the Greeks. I mean, even, of course, those people in Asia Minor, they were, they were pagans and heathens. And so when Christianity began, it had a lot of things to face, a lot of things to deal with. And that's what we're trying to do here tonight in this sermon is to show you some of the problems that it faced in those early days. Again, we have to appreciate the steadfastness. We have to appreciate the faithfulness of those people who continue to hold on to the truth who continued to follow the Apostles' Doctrine that is referred to sometimes in the Bible. And the Apostles' Doctrine is nothing more than God's Word because they were given that Word through the gift of the Holy Spirit. So tonight we're going to look at, there's about four problems that we'll look at here that the, uh, that the church faced in those early days. One of them was a political problem because Rome was the power at that time and Rome ruled the world. And it controlled Jerusalem, it controlled Judea, it controlled, you know, all of Greece and all of Asia Minor. It just had that, that much power. It was, in fact, as I pointed out the other night, it was a number one world power. And it held on to that for about 500 years. It had that power. It started about 150 years before Christ was born. And it went on till about 476 A.D. when Rome finally collapsed as a nation and uh, other nations, of course, came into power. But the, the, the Romans, uh, they, uh, and, and, and this was a big problem with uh, Judea because, you see, Judea had to pay their taxes to Rome. There were, of course, the publicans who were Jews who went around and gathered taxes and they had stations set up on roads. When you passed by, you had to pay a tax to travel this road because Rome, one of the things Rome did for the world is they were good road builders. I mean, they, they knew how to build roads and they had the men and the manpower and, and the ability and the money and so forth to do it. So in order to travel these Roman roads, you had to pay a toll. So these tolls that we pay are not new. They were way back in biblical times. So you had, you had a political problem. You had, as soon as Christianity was distinguished from Judaism, you see, you see Rome, they acknowledged the Jews. They acknowledged them. They, they, of course, they ruled them, but they allowed the Jews to do what they wanted to in the area of religion. But you remember as it was when Jesus uh, was uh, crucified? You see, the, the Jews could not do that just on their own or by themselves. They had to go through the process to get Pilate to okay it. And every system, everything like that had to go through the Roman system. And so they recognized the Jews and they recognized that they had a law and so forth. And as long as they were, you know, not rebellious and so forth, they just kind of let them be. But when Christianity came out of Judaism, we now have a new system that the Romans did not recognize. It was an illegal religion, actually, to the Romans. And so from the very beginning, from the very get-go, the Romans were opposed to Christianity. They just, they, they, they despised it. it. It had so many uh, attributes and so many characteristics that they, that they, were, they were not willing to accept. Uh, they thought that Christians were disloyal because 
you see, it, it, even in, in Judaism and so forth, when the emperor would come in or, you know, a leader or whatever, you had to bow down. You had to burn incense to this. And I guess the Jews must have just fell in line and did this. But, you know, us old Christians, we're a little bit, you know, cantankerous about things like that. We're not going to bow down to some other man, save Jesus Christ. And so they considered the Christians as rebellious and disloyal and and, and, uh, and, and so they, again, it, it brought a lot of contention between them. Uh, they, for instance, the refusal to offer incense onto the emperor, and especially the secret meetings that Christians held. Because of the persecution, they didn't open publicly or, or worship publicly or, or, you know, put them up a building somewhere. They met at night in private homes. And all that that did was begin rumors What's going on behind those closed doors? And so again, the political force of the day did everything within their power to squash this new religion. That's one of the major problems that Christianity had. You see, we don't, we don't un understand that because we've never lived through a time like that, but that's what the church went through in its very beginning. There were religious problems. The Roman religion, in contrast to Christianity, was altogether different. The Roman religion was external. It had its idols. It had, you know, everything was pageantry and so forth. And so as a result of this pageantry, you know, Christianity did not have that. And so once again, the Romans thought, well, this is, this is ridiculous for them not to do what we do. Christian religion was spiritual and it was internal. This could mean nothing but atheism to the Roman mind. And once again, you know, because of that, because of this religious difference between the two, uh, the two groups of people, uh, they, they were very much afraid of that. We mentioned this last night, the secrecy of the meetings, but it brought about charges of incest and cannibalism. And I mentioned last night at the end of my sermon that, that the church was uh, accused of being cannibalistic. Uh, you know, you know what a cannibal person is. He eats another person. Well, because they uh, operated behind closed doors and they heard rumors about how that they ate the body of the, of the Lord and drank his blood. You know, I mean, that's what the Bible says we do. You know, that's what Jesus said to do. He said, except you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Well, when that began to be rumored about, as far as religion was concerned, again, you can just understand how people would have taken that and added this and added that, and, and it became quite a scandal for the Christians to even uh, be able to function. All right, thirdly, there was the, the social aspect of this. Christianity had a special appeal to the lower class of people. In fact, our Bible says that the common people heard Jesus gladly. The common people. It was those educated. It was those in high positions and high uh, uh, areas of life that rejected Jesus. And so, and, and so Christianity does appeal to the common class. And you know, one of the things you'll find in a nation that, is, uh, that, that, that worships God, other gods, uh, they have within them, every, almost every nation I know of, that that, that, has, that is of a pagan nature and they have gods that they, statues made out of wood and stone and so forth. All of those nations have a caste system. And a caste system is where there are levels of people. You've got the real most important people up here and the less important, the less important. Finally, get down to people like you and me. And we're not worth much. And in India, that is exactly, what we, that's what we faced in India today. It still exists 100% in India, the caste system. And almost all the churches that we have in India are of the lowest caste. The trouble with the caste system is you can't ever get out of that. If you're born into it, you can't ever climb out of it. Uh, you, you can't ever even talk to people that's in the next system above you. You can't, you can't approach them. You see, in Christianity, it's not that way, is it? We believe all men are equal and all men are, are, are eligible to be able to have salvation, but that's not the way it is in a caste system. And, and we face many problems with that, of course, in India uh, because we are dealing with what they consider the lowest caste. In fact, in fact they, they look on us, when we go over there as a preacher, they look on us as being up here in this upper caste. They think we are up here in this upper caste. And they are so amazed. They are, they, 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 and once we get to meet them and so forth and hug them and so forth, 
they they just are so amazed that you know we would lower ourselves to their to their level. They don't realize we're not lowering ourselves. They they don't realize that we're just like them, and that's the way that Christianity is. So there's a social difference that existed in Christianity to all the nations of the world over there. Uh, the, the pure life of a Christian was a rebuke against the scandalous life of that upper class, and this brought the feeling that Christians were going to be a danger to society. And so once again, the cause to eliminate them because they are a danger to our social system, which we have, and uh, they're, they're going to eliminate this caste system. All right, another problem, the fourth problem that Christianity brought was economic, and Paul addressed that very thing. You see, when you have gods and goddesses and so forth in your country, uh, there's a lot of people that make money off of that. There's arts and there's, uh, you know, things that, that people do and little trinkets they sell and, and, uh, and, and all kinds of things uh, to be able to uh, make money for their trade and make money for their, their religion. And Paul recognized this at Ephesus in Acts the 19th chapter. He says, so that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. This is in your Bible. And Paul in Acts 19 is here saying that what the people were telling him, that our trade is in trouble. If you take away our gods and our goddesses, and especially this one here, Diana, who was considered a great uh, goddess, if you take this away, how are we going to make any money? our arts and our crafts and our sculptures and so forth. And in about the year 250 AD, Rome was troubled with plague. It was troubled with famine. This is a fact of history. It, there, there were terrible things that happened in Rome during this time. It was troubled with civil unrest. And the popular opinion was that Christians were to blame for it. That Christians were to blame because they weren't worshiping the God of the rock out here. In India, I don't understand, you know, how you can make something a, a, a god, but the area that we work in in India, the rock is a god. And I'm not, I'm not kidding you. I went up one day, was traveling through it, and they had this little hut. It was no bigger than this right here. Had a little opening in it. I looked inside, and there's two stones in there. And people literally crawl down on their knees, get in that little hut, and they pray to those stones. No wonder they got a caste system. You know, but they, and, and the monkey and the cobra, all of these are gods that these people have. And, and, and again, as I said, this is all the things that our people in the early days of the church had to face. In fact, you remember Nero, the story of Nero? It is believed that he burned Rome, that he set it on fire himself. And then he turned around and blamed it on the Christians. That didn't help the church any. That didn't help Christianity any. They had to struggle against that as, as to receiving the blame for the burning of Rome. All right, let's move on here. There were departures from the New Testament. That, those were the problems they faced. But now there were departures from the New Testament teaching. The teachings that Jesus had taught and the teachings that the apostles had taught. And we're going to look at a couple of these. During the first 50 years after the death of the apostles, remember we said John the revelator, he was still living about A.D. 95 and A.D. 96. So around the year 100, John died, and he was the last of the apostles to die. So 50 years later would have put it about the year 150. We're in 2023 right now, so this is a long, long time ago. So 150, there were, there were, there were uh, the church was struggling to maintain the purity of the church that had been established by Jesus. The forces that began to distract the church were from two different sides. There was an external problem that came or an effort to destroy the church, but there was also internal. The external was this. The church had gone from, which I had a map here, but the church had gone from Judea up through Asia, around the Mediterranean Sea, which is kind of the center of that European area, and it went up around the Asia and it went all over into what we now call Greece. And the Greeks were an upcoming people. They were, they were a very prominent individual. In fact, a lot of the philosophies, a lot of the principles of education 
were presented and were maintained and promoted by the Greeks. There was Socrates and Pluto and I think that's his, maybe it's Plato. I don't know. It's one of those guys. But you know, you've heard of those great scholars and there's a lot of quotes that come out as a, as a result of them. They were all Greeks. You see, the Greek people were a people that felt like that everything could be explained. Everything, everything had a reasoning behind it. And, and, and if you couldn't explain it, it wasn't worth studying at all. And so the Greeks believed that, that everything had a reason for it. And, and, and they had to rationalize everything instead of walking by faith. You see, that contrasted with Christianity, which was fast growing in Greece. It contrasted because here you have a people that had to rationalize everything. And then you have this people who says, no, we just take it by faith. We don't need a reason. We don't need rationalization. We just believe that God said this or that God wants us to do this. I'll give you an example. And, I, I, and, and it's on the subject of baptism. I don't want you to take me wrong tonight because I believe baptism is very much essential to salvation. And it's very sacred. But take the subject of baptism, just that one issue. To the Greeks, they could not rationalize that going down into the water and getting covered with water would save you. You think about that for a little bit. They were right. I mean, they were right in one sense of the word. If you're trying to rationalize it, if you're trying to say that there is a good reason for this, if you're trying to say that scientifically you go down into the water and you get covered with water, you come up out a new person. Rationally and scientifically, you cannot explain that. But by faith, we can explain that, can't we? Because by faith, we understand this is what Jesus said to do, to be baptized for the remission of sins. And so when we go down to that water, we come up out of that water, we come a new person. But you can only understand that through faith, and that's what created the problem with the Greek-speaking people and the Greek nation, because they wanted to rationalize. So you had, and, and you had all kinds of other, you know, when they went into Asia, there were, there were just a, a lot of practices and so forth that those people were used to, just like you folks, just like me. We're used to doing things a certain way, and, and uh, so we sometimes begin to think that that's a part of our religion, even though it has no religion to it at all, but we try to put it into our religion. And the, and the pagans and the heathens did the same thing. They tried to bring those things into the church. And it, it didn't fit because the rules of the doctrines of the church did not accept those uh, doctrines that they had. Internally, the church was torn apart by various interpretations regarding Judaism. The epistles of Paul should have settled these matters, but it didn't. And one of the things, I'll just mention one of them here, that created a problem from within the church that had to do with Judaism was circumcision. Circumcision almost divided the church in those days. In fact, in Acts the 15th chapter, that whole chapter is given over to this, where Paul goes because there was such an issue of it out there in the, in the Christian world. There's, you see, half of the people thought, well, you know, in order for you to be a Christian, you had to be circumcised. And the other half said, no, you don't need to be circumcised because that went out with the law. I believe that those people, because that's exactly what happened. You know, there's nothing wrong with circumcision, but the Jews, their process of being, you know, a part of God's family is that every male Jew at the age of eight years old had to be circumcised. That was equivalent to our baptism as far as the Jews being connected to the, 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 the Jewish nation and truly being a child of God. And even those who were brought in, you know, and, and, and even in the later years, it didn't make any difference how old you were. You had to be circumcised in order to be a Jew. Well, they thought that that was to continue on. And you can understand how and why that would be because if you practice something all your life and then tomorrow you're told, no, you don't have to do that anymore, that's kind of hard to walk away from. And that is exactly what happened with the subject of circumcision. So Paul he went down there to Jerusalem. He sat down with Peter, James, and John, who were the elders of the church in Jerusalem. They discussed this matter, and they came to a conclusion of it. And, of course, Paul went back on the way. But, but that issue almost divided the church. Put, could have perhaps put an end to it, but it didn't. It, and God didn't allow that to happen. But, you see, this was the internal fighting. 
that went on between the members of the church themselves over doctrinal issues. The apostles warned of a falling away like this, though. Paul was very outspoken in this matter on several occasions that the church would indeed have problems internally. He said, Acts the 20th chapter, verses 28 through 30, Take heed therefore unto yourselves, to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you the overseers, and uh, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now this is where I, I even I talked about last night, about Paul inviting the elders at Ephesus to meet him at Miletus. This is that incident. And he's telling them to feed the church of God. He said, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. So there's going to be folks that's going to come from the outside in and going to destroy or try to destroy the church. But he goes on to say, also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Brothers and sisters, man has never changed. If some, there are some people who seem to want to have, you know, all the credit and, and, and want to have all, everybody follow after them. And, and that was true in the early church. There were some within the church itself that would rise up and split the church and divide the church and <coughs> take disciples onto themselves. So you had, you had two different uh, things here that the church was facing. And again, remember, it wasn't, it wasn't denominationalism that we're dealing with here. We're dealing with major religions like the Roman religion or, you know, the, the pagan religion of the Asians and so forth. We're talking about major religions that the church was facing and, that, and there would be those who would come from without and from within. Hebrews 2 and 1, he says, Therefore, we ought to give the more heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. That was a warning to the Hebrew brethren. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 12. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. So you're going to have those who are just going to leave the faith and leave the church, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And then, of course, the passage of Scripture that we read, I believe it was Sunday night, we, we read this passage, and we'll just kind of briefly look at it again. He says, We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be soon, not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. You see, there would be those who would say, All right, the world's coming to an end. Have you ever, I, there, it's, been, it's happened to me about three times in my lifetime. People have said, you know, well, the world's coming to an end, that the Lord's coming, and he's going to be here tomorrow. Well, Paul said at this time, at least, early on in the church, he says, don't be troubled about a statement like that, even if it comes from a letter from me. Because he said, before that happens, before the Lord comes back, there will be a falling away. And he said, let not that man deceive you by any means. For that day, that is the coming of the Lord, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or is worshipped, so that he is God sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And so there would be this falling away of the true church. And Paul warns. He, he, he is the one who did all of these writings here, warning folks of what was going to happen to the church. All right, now we get to... The many areas of departure. The, the departure in organization. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here because I think we dealt with it last night pretty well. Talking about the leadership of the church. Talking about the organization of the church. How that God set it up that there were first be uh, the apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers and so forth. And he set up this organization. But there was this departure. And this is a, just simply again a matter of history. There was a change in the government of the church. And I, I, I mentioned Sunday night that it, you know, kind of culminated in the year 325 with Constantinople whenever he, as the Roman ruler, took over the church. But it started earlier than that. It started, of course, in the year 1 to 200. This was perhaps the most striking departure from the apostolic practice. This refers to the church as being ruled by one man. 
and this was the beginning of it very early on. Ignatius was one of, he would have been the follower of one of the apostles. You know, there was uh, John, who was the last of the apostles, Polycarp. If you've ever read anything, Polycarp was the, was, was the, the I don't know, I, is it predecessor? Predecessor is pre, isn't it? before. Anyway, the follower of John would have been Polycarp. So uh, this man, Ignatius of Antioch, he must have been one of the elders in the city of Antioch. But Ignatius of Antioch was the champion of this departure. He's the one that began this idea of establishing supreme rule over the church. Instead of having the elders and deacons like churches should have individually, we all be autonomous, he began to promote the idea that we need to have somebody as the president, somebody as the leader up here that will take charge of our religion. Elders were replaced by archbishops who had control over groups of churches. How it all started. And, and, and here's how, and, it, and you know, isn't it true that false teaching starts gradually? It, 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 if it comes to you just automatically overnight, you can't, you know, you say, no, that can't be. But it just kind of starts gradually. And here's how the departure from the leadership of the church started. Within each congregation back there, you know, Paul said, ordain elders in every city and they went and ordained elders in every church. And so, as I pointed out, say the church here at Develle, I'll just use you all as an example. You would have men here that would take charge of the leadership of this congregation and make its decisions, feed the church, and, and do whatever is necessary. But it got to the point that they felt like, well, we need somebody in charge of the elders. <laughs> we need somebody who is the president or the presiding officer over all the rest of the officers. That's not what God said to do, though. You see, God said we're all the elders, of course, and there's no one elder better than another. But we need this one man who becomes the presiding officer. They gave him the title of pastor or bishop. Bishop is mainly the title that they gave him. And really, the term bishop, as I pointed out last night, is just simply another way of saying an elder. But they gave him the title of bishop. Well, you know, it, it went on from there. And finally, you know, it, it gradually kept growing until they finally felt like, well, you know, here we are. We're a small congregation in, you know, uh, eastern Kentucky. Uh, wouldn't it be good if we had a man over a bunch of the churches in eastern Kentucky? And we'll call him Archbishop. And, and it just continually, it, it was a slow-moving process, but that's how it all started. So for the next 100 years, this man... Uh, who was the presiding uh, elder within the church. He had no uh, outside authority over any congregation other than his own, but it continually grew to where it, it developed into more than that. So here's where it went. The bishop of the large city congregations often took it upon themselves to establish smaller country churches. And again, I used the illustration last night about saying, well, I don't know what your biggest city here close to you is, uh, I'll just say Lexington uh, could be, you know, another city, but we'll just say Lexington. So the big bishop in Lexington, he would take it his charge to be in charge of over all of the churches in this part of eastern Kentucky. And, and, and then it, it just continually escalated from there. There's, that's where it went to. And uh, these groups of churches became known as synods. And so you'd be a part of a synod in home today. There are many, many churches that are getting very, very small. I'm talking about you know, every religion is, I guess, but a lot of the denominational churches around me are getting very small. And this system of having a headquarters and a man over, over you and so forth is almost within every denomination. I don't, I don't care what you, which one you name. They all belong to a headquarters somewhere. And so I have friends who tell me, well, you know, how do you operate? I said, well... We're autonomous. We don't answer to the church down the road. We don't answer to a headquarters someplace. We answer to Jesus. And they don't understand that because they've never experienced that, uh, that, that freedom that we have, that we only answer to Jesus. And so, they, you know, what, they, what they're wanting to do is they're wanting to get out of the synod. They're, because all their money that they take in on Sunday is sent to the synod, and they divide it amongst the churches in their synod. 
And uh, that's the system in religion today. And, and they say, no, I said, he said, we'd like to get out of the synod. So we checked in on it and he said, we're going to have to buy our, own, buy our building. They own our building. They own our land. And we have no right to it. And if you don't want it, well, just walk away, they said. And so that's, that's the, the system that, that religion has got themselves in. But you see, that's not the system that God intended from the beginning. By the year 190, Victor of Rome claimed to be the universal bishop. Now, the, the term pope was not established yet by this time. But he, he was called the Victor of Rome. In fact, the Church of England, which is, you know, the Church of England is a, a, a King Henry VIII who's who wanted to divorce his wife and the Pope wouldn't let him divorce his wife. So he said, fooey with you, I'll start my own religion. And he did. He started the Church of England. It's called the Episcopalian here in America. But King Henry VIII, it, it, he started this religion and it's, it's patterned after, of course, uh, Roman Catholic uh, faith. But they, they call their, their bishops and their deacons and so forth, Victor. So he in Rome, this man, before it all kind of put together, he claimed to be the universal bishop, but all the churches kind of ignored it. But Cyprian of Carthage, as time moved on, between 19, 195 and 268, was said to have done more to promote this hierarchy than any other individual. And then there began to be developed the priesthood. By 150, there was evidence of a distinction between the members of the church and the priesthood. You know, I know y'all. A lot of I know most of you know Guy Mowry. Guy Mowry, he was a wonderful guy, wasn't he? We call him. Uh, and he was just a boy. You know, he never did grow up. But anyway, I came to South Charleston, West Virginia. It's been fifty years ago. I came down there. And I held a meeting in South Charleston, West Virginia, and I didn't know a lot of the people, and there was, a, there was an old lady came up to me at the end of the service, and she was shaking my hand. She said, my son is a priest. I thought, okay. I didn't know, I didn't know, you know where she was going with this, but she said, my son is a priest. Well, I asked one of the brethren, Brother Cobbs was living, I said, who is it? He, she said, that's Guy Mallory's mother. And she was right. Do you know she was right? Guy Mallory was a priest. And you are a priest. And we all are priests of God. You see, they, they took that position and they made it so that it separated the, the laity from the clergy. And, and that God never intended that to be. We're all equal in the body of Christ. And so and, and, and so the bishop took the it was patterned after the Jewish system. But the next step, of course, was natural. Worship could only be conducted by the authorized priest. And it could only be done that way. And, and, and the worship could only be conducted by these few people. And this was the steps towards the ceremonialism that we see in religion today. I got tickled about one of my friends back home. He went to a college, became a preacher. And, uh, but he, he could perform funerals, but he couldn't perform weddings because he didn't have that, that level of training at the school. You know, he didn't have that diploma that said he could perform a wedding. He could do a funeral, but he could not perform a wedding. He could not baptize anybody. He didn't have that qualification either. Can you believe that? That, that you know, you have to reach a certain level to be able to perform some of these duties that we have as preachers. All right, there were doctoral departures. I, I, and I, and I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm really running late here, but uh, this is one of the perhaps one of the most important uh, uh, things that, that began to change within the church, and that was the subject of millennialism. Millennialism has to do with the thousand-year reign, and we often think that that is kind of a new doctrine that has come into being in the, in, in the, you know, the denominational world, but it was way back here in the year of 200 or so that the thought, at least, was planted, the seed was planted, and there was a, uh, uh, a man by the name of Serenthus, Eusebius. You've heard people or preachers talk about Eusebius. He was a church historian. And he writes about Serenthus, and he says that he was the one who first brought this false doctrine into the church. To emphasize that this doctrine was not held by the Apostle John, 
there was a book entitled Against Heresies. And uh, Polycarp was quoted that when he was with John and they had gone to a bathhouse and they saw Serenthus there, John said, let us flee, lest the bathhouse fall in for Serenthus, the enemy of the truth is within that's the way John, the apostle, felt about this man. Now, this, whether or not this, this is just the writings of man, of course, this isn't in the Bible. But Serenthus began this doctrine. Closely associated with this doctrine is premillennialism. You have millennialism, which is a thousand years, but you have a premillennialism, which is and involves what we often refer to as the rapture. And so you have time, you know, continuing on. It could be any point. It could say, we could say that it's 2023. And then, and, and then the doctrine of premillennialism says that Jesus is going to come and he's going to take the righteous off of the earth and leave the unrighteous here. And he's going to raise the righteous out of the graves and he's going to let the unrighteous in the graves. And time is going to continue on for another seven years. And uh, now I'm, I'm just kind of paraphrasing this because even though this is a very famous doctrine, it differs from religion to religion. But this is basically the basis of it. The world continues on for another seven years and it's called, uh, you know, the great, uh, train, uh, it, it's a terrible time. There'll be bloodshed and they often go to the book of Revelation where it talks about blood will run, you know, as high as the the, the bridles, uh, the horse's bridle and so forth. And they just have a lot of ways to describe it. But it'll last for seven years. At the end of the seven years, now Jesus came and he went back. Now at the end of the seven years, he's coming back again. And when he comes back again, he's going to bring these folks with him. And he's going to set up a kingdom. And, and that kingdom is going to reign, or he's going to sit on a throne somewhere. And again, religions have a different place. You know, the uh, Seventh-day Adventists, they think it's going to be in Independence, Missouri. Uh, that, that's the latter-day uh, uh, people. And, and then there's another group, of course, that says that Salt Lake City, Utah, there are folks that believe it's going to be in Jerusalem. I don't know where it's going to be, but for a thousand years, Jesus is going to sit here on this throne, and then the Judgment Day comes. Now, basically... That is the basis of premillennialism. Serendus was the beginning of that particular idea. The doctrine taught that Christ would come, establish a literal kingdom on earth, and reign over it for a thousand years. This doctrine was never taught by the faithful church. This was the first that even came up in the year of 200 or whatever this was. So the church had been around for a couple hundred years before it even was taught. But then again, this is where you have those from within that will rise up and take disciples after themselves. Now, let's just look at this idea for a little bit. The doctrine, this is what they call this, is the, is the, the rapture. And I know you've heard of the rapture. And uh, the rapture is, again, all, the, all what the word rapture means is a taking up. That's what it refers to, a going up. So the doctrine of the rapture is recognized by every religion as just a theory because there's no way to test this. There's no way to test it. I mean, if you've tested it, it's already happened. But there's no way to test it. It's a speculation. It is a, a theory is a speculation. It is an abstract principle of facts. It is a general formula to explain a phenomenon which is a spectacular thing. So that's what a theory is, and it is believed to be a theory. Now, how did such an idea as this get started? That's my question. You know, there's a quite a, thing, a few things going on here. I'm not saying it's going to be 2023, but when it happens, this is basically what they think is going to happen. Jesus is coming. He's taking these people. The first known writing. Now, Serenthus and, and, and so forth, you know, he came up with the idea, but the first known writing, and there's a lot of writings that have been preserved, but the first known writing of it is by a man by the name of Ephraim, Nisibius, in 373. So 373 years after Jesus was born is when this very theory was even printed. 
And here's what is printed. You can go online and find this if you want to. Just type in rapture and you can find all this information that I'm giving you. For all the saints and the election of God are gathered prior to the tribulation. And that's what this is called. I'm trying to think of the word. This seven years of the tribulation that is to come and are taken to the Lord lest they see the confusion that it is to overwhelm the world because of our sins. So what he's simply saying is that, uh, uh, that, that God's going to gather, you know, people together, take them out of this tribulation, out of this situation. All right, that's the first knowledge of it. And then you don't hear anything of it in any literature. I mean, it never got a foothold, hardly, in the year 300 or so. So the next time that you hear anything about it is 1830. That's 1,500 years that there's not anything even written or not anything even said about this issue. So in 1830, there was a what was called a, a powers court. I don't know if it's on here. It's on one of the slides. It was a, a, a powers court castle down at the end. There was powers court castle in 1830. In 1830, Margaret MacDonald, a 15-year-old 15 15-year-old 15 Scottish girl, had visions which included this secret rapture, the rising and, the, and so forth of the folks. And she had some mental problems, but her Presbyterian minister and forerunner of the Pentecostal and charismatic movement, Edwin Irving, promoted the doctrine based on her dream. He, he promoted it in 1830 in this power court castle convention that they were having in England. John Nelson Darby, which is a very prominent name. I'm sure some of you have a Nelson Bible. You know, that's a prominent name for Bibles. I'm sure some of you even recognize the name Darby because there is a translation. There's King James Version, there's the American Standard Version, there's Moffat's Version, and there's Darby's Version. He has a version of the Bible where he took the Bible and translated it, of course, into the English language. He was a minister of the Church of Ireland, later became a member of the Plymouth group that came to Plymouth, Massachusetts, came to America. And this man, as I said, was a very prominent individual. He also promoted this doctrine after attending that same conference there in 1830 when he learned of Margaret MacDonald's vision. He visited her in her home in Port Glasgow, Scotland, and later visited America where he brought this idea with him. The idea of this secret coming of Jesus and the secret taking of people from this earth and so forth. All right, the writings of John Darby greatly influenced another very influential man. His name was Cyrus Schofield. I don't know if you've ever heard that name or not, but Schofield is a prominent name in Bibles as well. In fact, when I started out, in fact, I believe Guy Mowry may have even had one of these Bibles and got me started on it. It, is, it was one of the first of the study Bibles. It was started back in about 1930. But you know what a study Bible is. You've got the, you've got the Bible printed in here. And uh, it's a King James version, okay? Schofield Bible was King James. But he had all these maps and all these references and, 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 and the concordant. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful study Bible if you just use the tools that are there, the concordance it has and all the maps it has and so forth. It's just a wonderful. And the way that he breaks down the, the topics, of course, within the, the Bible itself. But down at the bottom of Schofield's Bible, down at the bottom of every page was Schofield's notes. And he wrote what he believed this verse meant and so forth and so forth. It was Cyrus Schofield that gave the name to this doctrine. It didn't come from the Bible. You can't find this word in the Bible, the rapture. It was Cyrus Schofield that gave it the name because in his little notes, that's what he called it. And he took this. He was a, a dear friend of John Darby's and he took many of John Darby's notes and he put it in the Schofield Rents Reference Bible. And uh, in 1930, there was a million, a million in 1930 of these Bibles printed and were handed out to preachers all over the country. And this is where it began to take off. Not from the King James Version of the Bible, but from the little notes that Mr. Schofield had in his Bible. And today has become, of course, a steady, a steady thing. What were the scriptures 
uh, what scriptures is this based on? I mean, how do they how do they come up with this idea that you know some people's going to be taken and others going to be left and so forth? Perhaps there's a lot of them, but uh, the most famous is Matthew 24, 40 through 41, where it says, There shall be two in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken, and the other left. But there is nothing in this verse that implies the world's going to continue on. Nothing here can, that, that implies that. It, you know, you have to insert that in there that the world's going to continue on. But what he is simply here suggesting, he's giving an answer, Jesus is, to his, apostle, to his apostles. And the question was, what is the sign of thy coming? And the sign of the coming of Jesus was that people will be separated. You know, husbands and wives, parents and children, neighbors. There will be some that will be taken and others will be left. Not left to necessarily continue on in this world, but they will be left and separated simply in the judgment day. So, there are a number of flaws in this theory. First of all, you have too many comings of Jesus. You have him coming at a time that the Bible says nothing about. We know when Jesus comes, there's a lot of things that's going to happen. It's not going to be a secret thing. The Bible says that the trumpet shall sound. And, and, and uh, you know, it, I don't care where you are at, you're going to know that he's come. But in this instance, nobody knows he's coming. And, and, and you look around and, you know, the, the person standing beside you just immediately disappears. It's not going to happen that way. It is a denial of the universal coming of Jesus. Listen to this from Revelation 1 and 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Does that sound like a private coming? Does that sound like Jesus is going to come and you, don't, you won't see him? You won't know that he's come? No, he said he's coming with the clouds and every eye is going to see him. Matthew 25, 31 through 46, Jesus describes that in detail again, that he comes and he's going to separate the sheep and the goats. And everybody's going to see this. Everybody's going to be a part of one side or the other. And he will turn to the, the, the sheep and he'll say, enter into the kingdom that has been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And he turns to the ghosts, those on the left, and he says, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. First Thessalonians 4, that's where he talks about, you know, the trump of the Lord shall sound. And, and the angels, all the angels shall come and appear with him when he comes for that judgment day. It is, this theory is a contradiction of John 5. John 5 says, marvel not of this, for the hour is coming in the which all, did you get that word? When Jesus comes, all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. That's not what this doctrine teaches today in religion. What this doctrine teaches is that, they're, that they're only the righteous is going to rise and the unrighteous are going to stay in the graves. It is a contradiction of the last day passages. Listen to this, John 6. And this is the Father's will, which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. When are we going to raise? At the last day. Not not prior to the seven years or prior to the thousand years. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. John 6, 44, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. John 6, 54, whoso eateth my flesh, drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. John eleven twenty four. 24, Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again. This was with reference to Lazarus, whom Jesus came to raise back to life. And she said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. John 12 and 48, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one to judge of him. The word that I have spoken the same shall judge him when? In the last day. So I think that, you know, when we take all these scriptures, you have to understand that there's no seven year period of time in here. When Jesus comes, it's gonna be the last day and that's when people will be resurrected and will be judged. It is a contradiction of what will happen on the last day. Peter very plainly tells you what's gonna happen, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. 
the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. It's not going to, this world's not going to continue on. This world's going to be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking forward, hasting on to the coming of the day of God. Wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. This is why Revelation says we look for the new Jerusalem. We look for the new city that is not made with hands, and a city that is prepared for those who are ready to meet. All right, the thousand-year reign. The rapture is to believe to be that which will come before the thousand-year reign. And the thousand-year reign is where supposedly Christ is going to come back and sit upon this earth. I don't think that that is what Revelations 20 and 6 was all about at all. And I'll explain this verse to you. <laughs> Revelations 20, verse 6. This is about the only place they're ever going to get an idea of a thousand-year reign. It's the only place it's recorded. And it says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. What really bothers me is that every religionist who studies Revelation looks upon Revelation as being metaphorical, being representative of things. So you can't take it literally. And yet when we come to this one verse, we want to take this thousand years literally. But it simply is a reference to a large period of time. It is not a literal number. But let's break this down. He's talking about the blessing that comes to those who have part in the first resurrection. Some people think that that has reference, you see over here, to this rapture. This is the first resurrection. So blessed is he that has part of that. But if you look at this from the spiritual connotation in which it is to be interpreted, the first resurrection is when I arose from the watery grave in baptism. That's the only blessing I know that there is for man. You see, when we, when we are baptized, we go down into the water and we come forward and are resurrected to a new life. We, we, we have a new body. We become a Christian. The old man of sin is washed away in that water baptism. And then he adds this, that just tops it. He says, on such, the second death hath no power. You see, there's two forms of death. There is, death is only a separation. So the first death is when we're separated from our families and loved ones. The second death is when we're separated from God. And there's only one thing that'll keep you from being separated from God, and that is to enjoy and to experience the first resurrection, being resurrected to walk in the newness of life. Paul worded it that way, that we will rise to walk in the newness of life. So that, to me, is referring to every individual who has obeyed the gospel, who has been baptized. They will be the ones that, will, that, that, that death has no power over. And, and what did he say? He says, they shall be priests of God. They shall be priests of God and shall rule and reign with him a thousand years. Well, like I talked about Brother Guy. He was a priest. His mom said he was. And I'm a priest, I believe, because the Bible refers to us as priests. We are, the, we, we are, we are of a priestly family, and, 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 uh, and I think we can call ourselves the priests of God. So here's a point that I want to, and I'm almost done, mind you. Whoever reigns with Christ will reign while he reigns. Would you agree with me? If we reign with Christ for a thousand years, we will reign with him while he reigns. All right? In 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, and I'm not going to go back into what we talked about the other night, but I think we established the fact that Jesus received his reign when he went back to the Father. And Daniel, the 7th chapter, says there was given unto him a kingdom and honor and glory that his kingdom should stand forever. So his kingdom began when he went back to heaven and ascended from this earth. Then come at the end, Paul said, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For, verse 25, he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Jesus is reigning now. 
He's been reigning since he ascended back to the Father. And if you reign with him, it'll be from either that time till the last enemy is destroyed and the last enemy is dead. Somewhere in there. The, the, the Revelation calls it a thousand years, but it's been going on for 2,020 years now. But somewhere in there, you will have to reign with him because that's when he's reigning. At that time, he's going to give the reign back to the Father. He's not coming back to the earth to reign. He will give it back to the Father. All right. That's it. I, I, we've given you a lot of information to think about here tonight. But, but these are some of the things, the problems that the church faced, the early church faced back there. You know, the political, the religious, uh, the departure from the doctrines of the, of the true church and the doctrines of the Bible. Of course, the organization of the church, the leadership of the church, and then this millennial thing. Tomorrow night, we're going to talk about Holy Spirit baptism. So I'm sure you want to be here for that one. We're going to talk about some other things, original sin. That, that uh, was, was brought in the idea of original sin, of course, and several other things. So come back tomorrow night. But tonight, if there's anyone here that would like to have this, uh, this, this blessing that was passed in Revelations 20 of the resurrection or the raising up of a Christian, we want to give you that opportunity. If you're here, if you've never been a Christian, we invite you to come. If you're here, you've been a Christian, you've strayed away, have gone back into the world. We beg you to return. We'll pray for you and with you as we stand and as we sing. Page 600.